This is Brent of the Brookbush Institute and in this video we're going to go over manipulations or high velocity thrust techniques. I assume that if you're watching this video you're watching it for educational purposes and that you are a licensed professional with high velocity thrust or manipulation techniques in your scope of practice. If you're not sure check with your state board. Most physical therapists, chiropractors and osteopaths you're in the clear. I believe that ATCs you can't do manipulations in the United States, although other countries. Again, check your scope. Of course, massage therapists and personal trainers, these are generally not within your scope. Of course, you could continue to watch these videos just for educational purposes, learn a little anatomy, learn a little biomechanics. If you're going to do these techniques, please make sure that you have a good rationale for putting your hands on a patient. This should be based on assessment, and if you're going to assess, I'm hoping that you'll assess, use these interventions, and reassess to ensure that you're getting the result that you're looking for and have good reason to continue using this technique. In this video, we're going to do the proximal tibiofibular joint manipulation. I'm going to have my friend Yvette come out. She's going to help me demonstrate. Now, if I'm doing the proximal tibiofibular joint manipulation, Chances are I'm basing it on a lot more than just subjective symptoms. I want to follow that up with objective tests, like maybe my overhead squat assessment, maybe uh, Yvette here had knees bow in, knees bow out, or feet turn out on the overhead squat, something that would lead me to believe that there's some sort of um, dysfunctional motion happening at the knee joint itself. And then maybe I'd follow up with something as simple as like that hamstring length goniometry, so that I had some sort of continuous interval measure to actually address a, a progress and see some progress over time. So the next and last thing we would do is then palpation. We know palpation is our least reliable assessment, but it is really important in the case of this joint. This joint has a tendency to both become stiff in some individuals and hypermobile in other individuals. In fact, dislocation of this joint is not a totally uncommon diagnosis. So we got to make sure that we're not doing this technique on individuals that already have a very mobile proximal tibiofibular joint. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys how to do here is palpate the fibular head. And it's pretty easy. Usually I'll set somebody up at 90 degrees, just like I was doing like an anterior or posterior drawer test. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, just kind of use a pincer grip. If I go just below the joint line here of the knee, you guys can feel the, the fibular head right here. Now if I just grab on either side of my fibular head and give it a wiggle, that's actually pretty stiff, right? So if you guys feel no motion, no wiggle, or it's very hard to get it to wiggle, that's probably a good indication to do this technique. Now, if you grab it and it's pretty easy to wiggle, and it's only gonna be two or three millimeters, guys, we're not talking about huge motion, but that two or three millimeters happens really easy, don't do this technique. There's no need, and obviously we don't want to promote hypermobility that could potentially lead to dislocation, which is going to be a whole nother set of symptoms that we would have to try to address if that happened. Now, the technique itself is pretty quick and easy once you get the hang of it. We're going to use our second MCP, which this is a, a knuckle you need to get very used to using if you're doing manipulations. We're going to put this knuckle right over the fibular head. Now I'm going to show you guys this again in a close-up recap, so don't worry if you can't totally see where I'm putting my hand, but I'm going to put that MCP over the fibular head, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to smash my hand in between a vet's thigh and her calf. So rather than trying to like create a manipulation force this way, which is just, it's awkward and hard to do that, we can literally just kind of like whip her, her lower leg, use this is kind of like a spacer on her fibula so that we get the rest of her leg moving and kind of hold her fibula back while we do this thing. You guys ready to see what that looks like? So first MCP, I'm going to get nice and locked up. I want to make sure that I press in and I'm feeling her fibular head right up against that knuckle when I'm in that end range position. Once I know it's going to be there, and a little trick, a little clinical gem for you guys, sometimes it helps to turn the tibia into external rotation, right? So I'm even further pressing the fibular head into my hand. I get right there. Okay, I know I'm going to lock out right there. I tell the vet to give me a nice deep breath, 
and I mentioned before guys, unless we're doing like spine manips, breath doesn't totally matter, but it's a great way to distract your patient so they don't guard on you, right? So take a deep breath, she takes a deep breath, I get all locked out, and then, and that's it. It's almost like I'm trying to get her to kick her own butt. <laughs> Did you guys see how that worked? It's just that simple, boom. Sometimes you'll get a cavitation, sometimes you won't. Keep in mind, cavitations aren't necessarily the indicator of a successful manipulation. The manipulation and reassessment, right? What happened on your reassessment is indication of a successful manipulation. Now there is one other way to do this, right? We could have a vet go ahead and turn over and she's gonna lie face down. Now, in this case, we're gonna get a little weird. We're gonna use this knuckle against the fibular head. We're gonna do the same thing, kind of lock up, right? And then we can push down this way. Right. And we got a nice little pop there, right? So we did notice that that side was stiff. I did notice earlier that this side was not. The big problem with this technique, and probably why I don't use it very often, is if somebody has any rectus femoris tightness, like you have a very hard time getting their leg far enough that you can actually smash their leg together enough for you to apply enough force to the fibular head. Does that make sense? So if we get here, like you can imagine if she was super tight, I'd get here and then I'd go to do my manip and I just don't have, I'm not actually squeezing anything together. So you guys can try this. If somebody's fairly mobile other than this one particular joint, you might be able to get away with that. Otherwise, go ahead and flip over back on your back. This tends to be the better technique. So one more time, guys. Second MCP over the top of fibular head. You can externally rotate a little bit to feel that fibular head push into that MCP. We're gonna get all locked up so we know that when we do our final whip that we're getting pressure where we need it. And then of course, once we get there, take a nice deep breath and we just do a little, and that's it, right? We're just swinging the leg a few centimeters to get basically a posterior to anterior force against the fibular head. Stay tuned for your close-up recap. All right guys, for your close-up recap, starting with palpation, if we have the knee joint line kind of like right here, right? this is kind of where you guys would expect it to be. If we go down a little bit, you can feel this bump right about here. That's the fibular head. And if you pincer grip it, you should be able to move it back and forth. Now, of course, we're gonna base it on additional assessments, but if you were to feel stiffness, that might be an indication to do this particular manipulation. What I'm gonna to try to do is if you see where this finger is right behind the fibular head, I'm now gonna to try to put my second MCP right there, right? So I'm gonna just kinda of put my hand right up in there, getting through all of the soft tissue, and then I might even turn her tibia out. You guys can see I just kind of turned her foot out there. And what I should feel is I turn that out, like it presses the fibular head right into my MCP. And then I want to double check to make sure that if I press down, is that going to increase tension or increase the amount of force on my MCP? And if I get that check, then I'm going to go ahead and tell, tell a vet to take a deep breath. And I'm going to go ahead and just a real quick and that's it, right? Just like she's trying to kick her own butt. I right? just gotta remember to go a few centimeters. Again, the, one of the common mistakes that's made on manipulations is probably not moving enough. Although low amplitude means less motion and we're not doing high amplitude manips like we would move the whole leg, you still do need to move a good few centimeters to make sure you take up all tissue slack, to make sure that you're moving through all the soft tissue maybe somebody's clothing and actually getting to the point where all that's left is motion at the bone to force it. So again, for second MCP right behind the fibular head, I can even twist the tibia so that I press the fibular head into my MCP and then I'm gonna press it up against her thigh, make sure I got a good lock position once I'm set up, pop. 
A couple of points to recap. Knowing your anatomy and knowing your biomechanics will certainly help you choose the right technique for the right patient. If you're unsure whether manipulations are appropriate due to their higher intensity, it's okay to do mobilizations. Most research points to manipulations being slightly more effective, but mobilizations being very effective. And of course, we have those videos for you if you want to start with those less intense techniques. Make sure that if you are doing any technique that is based on assessment, and of course that you're reassessing, ensuring that the technique is effective for the patient that you're working on. And when it comes to all manual techniques, guys, manipulations, maybe more than any other, look for opportunities to get live education. Although I know videos are convenient and I'm happy to have these up for you guys to watch, it would be so much more helpful to use those videos as a recap of one-on-one -on -one attention with somebody who's experienced with manipulation techniques. At the very least, grab a colleague, grab a friend, and start practicing these before you bring them into clinic and start using them on patients and clients. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments box below.